Let's begin with Michael Behe, uh, who uh, Glenn already introduced you to briefly. Um, Michael Behe is one of the current uh, intelligent design proponents, uh, biochemist. And uh, one of the things that he thinks he invented is irreducible complexity. And what, what does he mean by that? This is supposed to be an argument for, uh, or ar argument against evolution, or at least argument against evolution explaining everything. Uh, it's supposed to be an argument proving that there's intelligent design in the universe. And it works like this. The basic idea of irreducible complexity is that you can find an organ, if you look around, you might find one somewhere, that has many well-arranged parts, so it's complex, right? But if you remove any one part, the organ becomes useless. And that's what makes it irreducible. You can't, you can't take a piece out. And therefore, the entire organ has to arise from a single mutation. That's the idea behind this. And such a mutation, of course, would be so improbable, it can never have happened by chance in the known universe. Therefore, it has to have been some sort of intelligent intervener, um, whether time travelers or aliens or, you know, who else, possibly. Um, his favorite example, of course, is the bacterial flagellum. Now, it's not just any bacterial flagellum that he talks about a lot. He talks about specifically um, the one that is in the E. coli bacterium. Um, if any of you know, if you follow the news at all, how fatal E. coli bacteria infections are, the uh, flagellum in an, a bacterium, an E. coli bacterium, actually makes E. coli more deadly because it allows it to move around more effectively. Uh, and so it's actually, he's, he's arguing that God intelligently designed bacteria to kill us. <laughs> and he, do, he, he has an impressive looking argument. He, it, you can see uh, the diagram of the mechanical parts of the thing here. Um, there's at least 30 protein components that have been arranged in such a way to allow it to operate as basically a sort of crude propeller. Uh, and it looks kind of like this little snake-like thing that just spins around. And you look at this and you go, wow, that looks pretty impressive. That looks intelligently designed. It looks like uh, you know, something some, someone would engineer. And of course, that's his argument. If you take any piece of this out, uh, it uh, no longer functions. That's not entirely true, but uh, there are aspects of it in which it is true. Now, the question is, he's talking about some intelligent designer, either time travelers or aliens, or you know, someone else. Uh, has intelligently designed bacteria to be more effectively capable of killing us. Um, wouldn't you immediately assume that we, there's some sort of either government conspiracy, a la X-Files, or uh, some sort of alien power that is trying to kill us with bacteria by making the bacteria more effective at killing us? I mean, that's normally how you would react to this kind of discovery, but that's, of course, not how he uses it. Now, let's look back at some other more complex things. Imagine your hand. If you look at the operation of your hand, now, your hand doesn't really work without the rest of the uh, lower arm, of course, because most of the stuff that operates your hand is there. It actually has, uh, you, there's 13 protein components of the bacterial flagellum, but there's 26 bones, 40 muscles, and 40 tendons, and thousands of motor and sensory nerves and other components in your hand. Um, it's an extremely, supposedly well-designed instrument for what it does. It's not entirely irreducibly complex, but there are components of this, if you pull it out, the thing doesn't work very well. What's the difference between this and the bacterial flagellum? Uh, Behe would probably agree that that was evolved or could have evolved by natural selection. He thinks that, you look at this uh, lethal bacterial organ, uh, that that somehow is an exception to this case. So what is the alternative theory? What's the theory he's trying to oppose? Basic evolution theory. Basic idea is mutations arise by random chance. The environment kills or rewards the mutant based on whether the random mutation is helpful or not. The rewarded mutants reproduce and thrive, and uh, the process repeats over a long period of time. And consequently, rewarding mutations accumulate, eventually leading to a new species, and hindering mutations die off, either immediately or gradually. And this can explain all life on Earth. That's basic evolutionary theory. You can add some tweaks to it, as we have done. Uh, there are more complexities to it, but that's the, the basic gist of it, where you start. Now, a prediction that this would lead to is that the bacterial flagellum, just like the human hand, arose slowly bit by bit. First, there were just a few proteins, then by mutation, a few more, and so on, eventually building into the elaborate organ uh, that it is now. Now, each useful or harmless mutation will be, probable, will be a probable outcome of chance within the time span known to have been available. That's the basic prediction of evolution theory. And this is what Behe is saying has failed. He thinks this prediction has not come true in this case. 
But let's look at that again. Um, we have that bacterial flagellum on one side. Uh, you might recognize the picture from earlier. On the other side, we have something else. Uh, what is that? That's a different organ, but it looks very similar, doesn't it? Uh, it's actually not a propeller. It's not a propulsion system. It's a type 3 secretion system. It's actually an injector needle uh, that bacteria use to uh, inject, basically, other bacteria um, or suck things out of other bacteria. It's essentially an intruder, a needle operation. Now, you can notice that this is a much simpler device. It has far fewer components. Uh, there it's much more reducible. There you can pull parts out of it, and it'll still function, just not as well. And you can see yet how slight changes to this could make it more like a propeller. So a bacteria could start using this to both move around as well as for its original function. And you can imagine that it could get more sophisticated over time as it became uh, more perfected to be a propeller. So you can see how one could evolve into the other. Behe ignores this, of course. Now, if Behe behaved like a scientist um, that he's supposed to be, he would, first of all, spearhead experiments and laboratory research to confirm the key premise of his theoretical model, that the flagellum appeared spontaneously fully formed. There are actual experiments and actual research he could do to confirm this, but he doesn't do any of it. He would also, by the way, lobby Congress to form a national defense plan against the weapons, uh, you know, weapons of mass destruction manufacturing enemy that he just discovered, uh, but he seems completely uninterested in the fact that whatever designer he's talking about has engineered bacteria to kill us, but anyway. What actually happens is that Behe does no research at all. Uh, he has, in fact, not discovered any new scientific fact of any kind. Um, he has no actual theory either. Glenn made a really good demonstration of this fact. He, Behe has no suggestion as to how, when, why, or by whom. Uh, in fact, he can't really make any predictions at all with his theory because he doesn't have a theory. So he's not acting like a scientist. He's acting more like a theologian. Now, here's how a scientist would act, especially a biochemist, by the way, whom Behe officially technically is. First of all, he would start by counting the right things. Behe actually talks about the complexity of the organ itself. He looks at the actual mechanical components of the organ when it's formed. One thing he has never done uh, is talk about what actually results in that organ, which is the DNA code that codes for the construction of the organ. If he was a scientist and actually wanted to know what the complexity or the origin of this organ was, first of all, he would try to isolate the DNA code that codes for its construction. He would look for the DNA codons uh, that actually produce it. Because all organs, even in single-celled organisms, are the inevitable outcome of the chemistry of the DNA code. That's where the complexity actually is. That's where he should be looking. He should be isolating those DNA uh, commands that actually produce the organ itself. But he's never done this. It, had he done this, even with the bogus theory that he has, he would at least have advanced science significantly, but he doesn't even do that. Now, this requires isolating the genes that code for the building of the flagellum, and then locating correlates to those genes uh, in other microbes. Microbes with flagella and microbes without flagella. Microbes with other organs that look kind of like a flagellum but are not. Uh, that's what a scientist would do. He'd actually compare this and he would actually try to see if he can create an ancestry of these gene codes. And that would contribute again to scientific knowledge regardless of what his ultimate result was. Even if he found out that his theory was refuted by this, he at least would have advanced scientific knowledge. But he doesn't even touch this at all. This is not what he's doing. So the, the real question is, uh, why does he avoid doing that? Um, I think, obviously, because if he did it, he would refute his theory. Um, he would actually advance science and uh, go against his actual plan and support evolutionary theory by actually discovering the genetic uh, heritability of the genes that lead to the production of the flagellum. Now, why is that motor there? You have that 30 proteins. The hand is actually more complex than that. Um, but why do you see this advanced propeller there? Is that really impressive? Should we be amazed that uh, single-celled organisms have this complex propulsion machine in them? Actually, no. Um, in point of fact, single-celled life is over six times more evolved than plants and animals. Uh, you often don't think of that, but the bacteria that's inside your body is way more advanced than you. Uh, it's survived a hell of a lot longer. It's been evolving a hell of a lot longer. In fact, not only is the rate of evolution, not only is that has it been around six times longer in terms of time, but rate of evolution for single-celled life is also up to 500,000 times faster than for animals like us of our size. This means single-celled life is around three billion times more evolved than your hand. Three billion times, uh, in case you didn't hear that correctly, more evolved than your hand. So obviously it's going to have some pretty sophisticated machinery in it. It's been around a long time. If you look at the history of life from what we've documented in terms of uh, dating and looking at uh, stratigraphy and uh, radiometric dating of things, looking at fossils and whatnot, we know that single-celled life was around for about 2.4 billion years before it ever figured out that it could start cooperating into larger organisms. 
Now, by cooperating, I don't mean what we mean by plants and animals. I mean like algae, stromatolites, and things like this. Uh, cooperative cells that don't differentiate, but they work together to accomplish ends and form structures together. Eventually that happened. It took another billion years of that to occur before finally cells got sophisticated enough to actually start differentiating. So when they were cooperating, they could differentiate into different tissues, and then you get plants and animals that we recognize today. But they're still bacteria colonies. I mean, you're, you're basically a co colony of bacteria that's figured out how to cooperate and differentiate its functions. And that's the reality of what we're looking at. Now let's look at this in terms of Behe's theory, and I'm gonna pull away the curtain, and it's not time travelers, and he, he is, doesn't really believe in aliens. He means God, so let's, let's really talk about his actual theory. Look at that first 2.4 billion years where single-celled organisms are tinkering around. What was God doing all, during all that time? I mean, that's a really lousy designer. It takes you 2.4 billion years to figure out, you know what, maybe I should have these cells work together. Um, and then eventually he figures, you know, we, they can cooperate. I mean, that's still a billion years of that. He still couldn't figure it out. It took him a billion years of tinkering with cooperating cells before he comes up with plants and animals. And then that's, that's 0.6 billion years ago when that started. It still took him 500 million years to figure out apes, right? Uh, and then another 4 million years of tinkering before he figures out how to make people. And this doesn't really make a lot of sense, and it's certainly not something he could have predicted from his theory. He couldn't start from the theory that God did this and then predict the timelines, predict the scales, predict all of the, this pattern of organization. That's not the case. His theory doesn't work that way. Now, evolution, however, explains all of this. It explains why it took so long. It explains why it followed this particular pattern of process. So a real theory of intelligent design would attempt to predict these things. It would predict and explain why animals are constructed from colonies of single-celled organisms. In other words, cells. Why are you made of cells? Um, actually, intelligent design doesn't explain that. Rather than uniform tissues, uh, why can't God just make you, your muscles out of muscle? Why does he need to make them out of a bunch of uh, cells, each one with its own little DNA code inside, just like a, a separate cell? It would also explain why bacteria have inhabited the planet six times longer than multi-celled plants and animals, versus both appearing at once, of course. That would be the obvious thing for a designer to do. It would explain why bacteria had to be given flagella to move around, uh, rather than simply being imbued with the power of movement. I mean, he's God. He can do whatever he wants, right? And then why bacteria? Why not just demons? Or, hold on, why, not, why have any diseases at all? Uh, this doesn't make any sense. Evolution can explain this. Intelligent design theory cannot. Okay, so that's the situation we're at now. Let's go back 2,000 years to the Roman Empire. Uh, the Romans inherited Greek logic and math and science and improved upon it in various ways. I'm going to talk about a particular story. Uh, around 190 uh, AD, 191 AD, um, Galen actually engaged in a public demonstration of a sort of vivisection experiment for crowds to see in which he refuted the natural selectionists of the ancient world. And yes, there were natural selectionists of the ancient world. How did that come about? What is the whole theory of this? Why did he do this? Now, Galen himself is the ancient Behe. He's an intelligent design advocate. Um, the only difference is that he actually had good arguments because he didn't know tons of stuff that we actually know now today. And he did this in the Temple of Peace uh, in the Roman Empire, in the capital Rome. Uh, it was a common place. They had a library of science books. Uh, scientists would gather there to discuss things. And there would be these kinds of public surgical demonstrations as well. Uh, people would gather together to see and be wowed by what happened there. The backstory to this is told in a book by uh, David Sedley, uh, Creationism and Its Critics in Antiquity. Um, and I think it's really cool to be studying a field in which there are people writing books about creationism and antiquity. Um, I don't know if you find that cool, but I do. Nevertheless, the book exists. Uh, one of the things he points out in there is that the, basically the battle lines between natural selectionists and creationists in the ancient world, and these are pagans, by the way. This is before Christians came around. Uh, these are pagans debating whether God did it or whether it was something else. It starts with uh, Anaxagoras and, and leads to Democritus, who argues against Anaxagoras or develops, expands on Anaxagoras. Plato argues in here. Aristotle argues in here. Epicurus weighs in. And this is all still centuries before Christianity came about. But this process set up these two different views. One is you know, intelligent design of some fashion. The other is the ancient theory of natural selection. And this is their theory. And this goes back, like I said, centuries before Christianity originated. 
they argue that random mutants form by atoms accidentally sticking together. So you have like arms sticking out of heads, and you have hearts outside the body, and you have people without hearts, and you, all kinds of configurations of things would randomly occur. But of course, most of those things will die off immediately. Uh, it'll be like something that went through the teleporter in the movie The Fly. Um, the lucky mutants would survive, and the unlucky ones would go extinct, so we wouldn't see them anymore. All we would see are the ones that had organs or just accidentally organized the right way. And after a long period of time, competition would weed out even the weaker ones, and you'd only get the luckiest ones that would remain. And because, this is a key part of their argument, because the universe is infinite, and they had arguments for this, that it was, with infinite stars and planets, yes, they believed stars were distant suns with planets orbiting them, or planets, stars orbiting planets, it depends. Either way, stars were distant places where there are other planets with other things on them. Every possible combination, therefore, has been tried on some planet somewhere, because it's infinite, right? It's every, every single one. Therefore, improbability is not an argument for intelligent design. Now, this is the position of the natural selectionists of antiquity. Now, what was key here is they had not thought of these two elements, common descent and change over time. They were not aware of this fact. They were not aware that uh, monkeys were related to people. They were not aware that things had changed over time. So evolution was not part of their theory. And this is because they hadn't figured out chronology of fossils yet. They were studying fossils, but they hadn't gone enough into the work to figure that out. And here's Cicero. Uh, you might know Cicero. You might have heard of him. He also wrote some really interesting books in philosophy. Uh, and he writes this, and you might, those of you who know the evolution debate will be astonished to hear this was written 2,000 years ago. Does it not deserve amazement on my part that there should be anyone who can persuade himself that a bunch of mere atoms can just fly along at random and accidentally collide to produce a world of utmost beauty and splendor like this? I don't see why the person who believes this can happen who believes this can happen, doesn't also believe it possible that if an infinitely many copies of the 21 letters of the Latin alphabet in gold or any other material you like were thrown into a pot and then shaken onto the ground, they might form a readable copy of the annals of Ennius. I'm not sure that luck could manage this even to the extent of a single line. Those of you will recognize the monkeys and typewriters argument here, um, except he's using a imagined Scrabble set because they didn't have typewriters yet. But it's the same concept. I mean, of course, he's wrong. If you have an infinite number of pores of those letters, then actually you will get the complete uh, annals of Ennius. But um, he was basing this on an ancient understanding of combinatorics, the actual permutation theory. They actually figured out permutation theory in the ancient world. There was, there was logic to his argument, even though he didn't quite understand the significance of infinity in this argument. Nonetheless, this is a familiar argument. It's the same argument being made by creationists even right after Darwin's time, even in Darwin's time. Now, it's important to understand that ancient physiology was pretty advanced at the time. They'd figured out a lot of stuff, uh, especially, now most people think of Aristotle as the first to be doing dissections and things, but no, Aristotle's old hat. Uh, after Aristotle, you had Herophilus and Erasistratus. These guys did some pretty impressive stuff. They were the first people to actually get their hands on human cadavers and start dissecting those. Uh, and they had mapped out in the human body motor and sensory nerves. Um, they knew the difference between those two kinds of nerves and mapped them out. They had engaged in ancient neuroscience, localization of brain functions. They would take an animal, cut out a piece of its brain, and see what stops functioning. Uh, so they were able to determine that vision was processed in a part of the brain, sound was processed in a part of a brain, uh, certain kinds of motion were processed in certain parts of the brain. So they knew that different parts of the brain were controlling different parts of functions, including vocalization. Uh, so they were aware at this point, contrary to Aristotle, that the brain was actually uh, where the mind exists. And they had broken it down, and they knew it was operating into pieces, different functions assigned to different parts of the brain. They also came up with the idea originally of what we now take for granted, which is the existence of organ systems. The fact that there are several organs working together for digestion. So you have a digestion system. You can talk about those organs separately as one system. They actually came up with all of these things, the basic ideas of organ systems at the same time. And uh, they also were trying to explain all of these organs working together in terms of mechanical explanations using references and anal analogies to technologies that they were aware of at the time, including pumps, siphons, levers, and robotics. Um, technically autom automata rather than uh, modern definition of robots, but uh, in a colloquial sense, the ancients had robots, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But they're aware of these concepts and were trying to explain how the human body worked in terms of these uh, instruments. So that's the context in which we get to eventually Galen's uh, demonstration in the Temple of Peace. His opponents were people advocating the view of another scientist by the name of Asclepiades. 
And Asclepiades actually had argued that the kidneys, this is the key thing, that the kidney, he was trying to explain other parts of the body, but the kidneys, he said, were either superfluous organs um, and that the uh, urine that ends up in the bladder, uh, that it gets expelled um, through the urine system, was just secreted by the bladder itself. It just came out of the wall of the bladder. The kidneys performed no function. Or else the kidneys were an accidental sieve, that they just filtered the blood and they operated like a sieve or a sponge and it uh, mapped people, or uh, sieved things out and then you got just sort of a, an effluence of the blood that got into the, um, into the bladder. Now Galen argued against this and said that actually I can prove intelligent design by refuting you. And that was Galen's point. Now Galen was an expert on the vocal system um, he was not an expert on the heart. Everybody rags on him for getting the heart wrong. That's fine, because he wasn't actually an expert in that field. No, he was an expert in the vocal system and in the renal system, and that's where the kidneys are. So, what did Galen do? This is the experiment he ran in the Temple of Peace, remember. The crowds here watching him do this. Now, before he set up this experiment that wowed everybody, um, he would already lecture on a previous experiment that he had run, which determined this. First you, well, take a slave. Yes, this is a slave-holding society, and they use slaves for human experimentation, nonetheless. Uh, that was the society they were in. You have a slave uh, drink water and go without food. You measure the amount of water they intake. You measure the output of urine during the same day. And you found that they're about the equal. Uh, the amount of water you take in comes out pretty much uh, as, as water, as long as they don't sweat. They're aware that some water gets out of the skin through sweat. They were aware that some water gets out in your bowel movements, so they counted for that. Did not yet know that some water gets out of your body through respiration. But nonetheless, uh, he could map and show that the amount of water you're taking in is the amount of water that's coming out of your urine. They've got to be related. There's, it's statistically unlikely that that's just random chance. And then, of course, you, as a doctor and a scientist, you would taste the urine and determine that uh, you would notice that you know, people who try to drink urine don't fare very well. Uh, the color, the smell, toxicity of it indicate that it's waste material. So the conclusion was that urine is wastewater extracted from the blood. And in fact, water transfer from the digestive system to the blood had already been demonstrated before, so that was already an accepted fact. So all of this is the science that they had at the time. So this is what Galen then did. He anesthetized a pig, a live pig, who's still living. He opens it up surgically, and he would show the kidneys and ureters and bladder to the audience, and he would ligate the ureters, he would tie them off. And what you would see is that the urine coming out of the kidneys would start to fill up and balloon right before the tie point, showing that there was something coming from the kidneys. Therefore, that refuted the whole idea that the kidneys were superfluous. And nothing's entering the bladder, so he proved that the bladder was not secreting anything. So whatever's getting into the bladder is coming to uh, the bladder from the kidneys through the ureters. He demonstrated that conclusively. Then his next step, you squeeze the ureter as much as you can, and it doesn't go back. You can't push it back through the kidneys. So the kidneys clearly weren't a sieve. He refuted that idea. So Asclepiades' theory was uh, demonstrated to be false. Something in the kidneys was blocking it from going back the other way. And then, of course, you can section the ureter. You, you cut the little ballooned part, and urine gushes out, thus proving that what was filling, uh, that thing was urine, in fact. So that means the urine's coming from the kidneys. He proved that. And then you can release the other one and show that the urine goes into the bladder and fills it up and can be excreted uh, or poured out through um, the urinary tract. So Galen basically refuted Asclepiades with this demonstration and declared, therefore, God made pigs. Now that's the, the basic idea. Now the conclusions he reached is that, you know, kidneys produce urine by extracting water and waste from the blood. It transfers it to the bladder through the ureters. Kidneys do not do this like a sponge or a sieve. Some sort of attractive force must select waste and allow through only in one direction with no visible unidirectional valve. Now we now know that this is accomplished through osmosis and electrochemical forces, but Galen's point was that there was something intelligent about the kidney. The kidney was too smart. It couldn't just be some random organ that was thrown in there. So this is Galen's argument. Such a highly selective, non-mechanical force could not be explained by the atomic model proposed by natural selectionists. The organization of the parts is too optimal to be explained by chance. Galen argued that even given infinite trials, most surviving organ systems will be suboptimal. They'll still be around, but they won't be sub they won't be perfect. They'll be good enough, but improvable. And he's showing that there's no way to improve these organs. Now, it turns out that's not true, but nonetheless, that's what he was arguing. Therefore, according to his reasoning, intelligent design was the only plausible scientific theory. And now that was kind of true until Darwin came along and showed how you could explain a lot of this stuff. Now, in reality, even Darwin didn't explain smart kidneys. Darwin had no explanation for this. 
Smart kidneys were not explained until the 20th century when we realized that actually what's going on is there's a DNA computer which chemically regulates salinity and selectively retransports useful chemicals back into the blood. So you actually have a computer program in your cells that tells the cells to go and find the stuff that it doesn't want to be in the urine and puts it back in the blood, um, which is pretty intelligent, yes. But they weren't aware of that kind of thing going on at the time. Now, Galen made a whole bunch of these arguments. He wrote a huge, massive volume in doc documenting all his massive and detailed surgical and uh, anatomical research to prove that God designed uh, the human body. And he put this in a book called De Usu Partium, which is on the usefulness of the parts, demonstrating how incredibly useful every single part was in terms of its design. And this is the greatest work of scientific creationism in history. It's never been rivaled since, uh, and it had never been rivaled before it. In it, he actually invented irreducible complexity as a concept. Star, sorry, sorry, Michael Behe, but you didn't come up with it. So here's Galen, quote, certainly you could not point out any machine more brilliantly conceived than one so accurately constructed that if any detail on the arrangement is altered, the whole thing will be destroyed. For a craftsman does not require extraordinary skill to build something that retains its usefulness even when many parts are added or subtracted, but the mark of an intelligent design is clear in those works in which the removal of any small component brings with it the ruin of the whole. Now let's just be grateful that Galen did not run NASA. His idea of intelligent design is not entirely sensible, but nonetheless, this is the same idea of uh, Behe's argument. If you remove any single component, it collapses, and that's indication of design. And of course, the prediction this theory makes is that if biological organs are intelligently designed, then in most cases, no better arrangement will be physically possible, given the materials available and the functions to be performed. And some of Galen's examples of this were impressive, uh, you have to admit. Uh, he studied the nerve transport system in the neck. Millions of nerves go exactly where they need to, we need to go. Protective channels and tissues for the nerves grow exactly where they are needed to go. Bones, muscles, and sinews arranged so as not to pinch or cut any of those nerves. This is pretty impressive. Biomechanics of the arm, hand, and leg, meticulous intricacy of the interacting parts, muscles, bones, sinews, nerves, arteries, veins, could not be reorganized in any better way for generalized functions of running, lifting, and tool use. Precision of the vocal system, this is one of his areas of specialty. Nerves and muscles and other structures operate in harmony despite being scattered across the body, your tongue, lips, larynx, diaphragm, and brain, and are ideally arranged for producing intelligent speech. He had many others, but these are the kinds of arguments he makes. Well, let's go, let's jump ahead 2,000 years and see how evolutionists and Dar you know, from Darwin's idea figured this out. They added one other element that was not added by the natural selectionists, which is common descent and change over time. And this is key because what you have now is a simple organ becomes more complex by successive mutations, more optimal, more optimal mutations being favored over less optimal mutations, producing highly optimal arrangements given a very long time span. And it does this also through various processes, including scaffolding, a 20th century innovation on Darwin. An organ with an entirely different function, you know, for example, a protein transport valve, like I showed you earlier, the secretion system, evolves progressive additions that allow it to perform a new function, like flagellar propulsion. Then efficiency is increased by evolving away components that are no longer needed for the new function, the quote unquote scaffolding, the protein transport valve components. So what remains looks irreducibly complex when in fact it was reduced to that minimal arrangement by evolution, having started clunkier and more ad hoc. Hence it started out reducibly complex. That's what we know now in terms of how these organs came about and everything that impressed Galen can be explained through evolutionary theory much better than Galen's theory. But Galen had some additional arguments. He argued, how does a fetus know exactly how to build itself so perfectly? This is a good question. Galen demonstrated that this construction project required the precision arrangement of hundreds of bones and thousands of muscles, nerves, and other organs and tissues. How is that possible without a guiding intelligence? How do the organs then know exactly how to continue growing, healing, and interacting correctly? This is also another one of Galen's arguments. How does the kidney know exactly which chemicals to remove and expel as urine, and which to retain for use in the blood? What coordinates the disparate organs of the vocal system? Galen couldn't think of any explanation other than intelligent design. And when he looked at uh, the idea of the construction of the fetus in the womb over time, it's being brilliantly crafted over time. How, who is doing this? Who is interacting this? Now, Galen's argument was not that God intervenes directly and is, a, is slowly like a sculptor or, you know, organizing every single fetus and every single animal on Earth. What a tedious job that would be. No, Galen was actually aware of a technology at the time 
uh, robotic theaters. Uh, you could actually have fully automated robotic theaters that would entirely act out an entire five-act play, and you would program them with hidden uh, cogs and wheels and ropes and stuff, and they would be powered by weight. You would have a weight go down, and it would run the whole system, and you could actually program different plays by programming different wheels and cogs and different uh, uh, cords going in different directions. This is a technology well known at the time, and you have like animated dolls doing things and so, so forth. And he argued that there must be something smaller than the human eye can see that's just like this, that's programming this set of cogs and wheels that's set in motion that once you drop the weight, it just proceeds to uh, underact the pro or take out the program or carry out the program and produce the fetus. That's actually true. We call it DNA. Galen wasn't aware of that fact. But Galen did anticipate the idea of DNA. This is what he's talking about in terms of how this stuff works. Now, this is what really happens, is what we know now. The intelligent construction and operation of human and other bodies is the unfolding of a chemical computer program stored as DNA. This is what Galen recognizes as a possibility. We now know intelligence is not needed, nor is it even the best explanation for these computer programs to arise and develop over time. That's a possibility first realized by Darwin, although he wasn't aware of DNA yet. Evolution, in fact, does a better job of explaining the peculiarities of these DNA computers throughout the biosphere, a possibility anticipated but not yet known to Darwin. Once we could study DNA, we could actually start studying the evolution of DNA codes, how the program evolved over time through natural selection and mutation and whatnot. This is completely unknown even to Darwin, it was also unknown to Galen. So Galen's intelligent design theory. One of the things he studied were eye, 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 eyebrows and eyelashes. Uh, perplexed him. Eyelashes especially, they always maintained a fixed length. They never grew long like most other hairs. So he dissected the related tissues in an attempt to explain this oddity with his own theory of intelligent design, discovering that eyelashes, for example, grow from a cartilage-like tissue called the tarsal plate. Galen concluded that the only scientific model that fits the facts required God's powers to be limited, and in particular ways. His representative example was this uh, phenomenon of human eyelashes. So Galen formulates a specific theory as to how God acts and why, and th these are parts of his theory. God is subject to the laws of physics. Um, God can't do whatever he wants, uh, which laws follow necessarily from the nature of the materials that comprise the universe, space, time, matter, and energy. God has to, he's limited by physics. He's not a master of physics. God has a body, uh, he must, obviously, because if he's invisibly present everywhere but physically interacting with everything, it's the only scientifically plausible way he could sense things or make things move, right? Makes sense. And God realizes the best possible world within these constraints, thus explaining all natural evils and defects and all peculiarities of body, body design, eyelash structure, and so on. This is, a, this is a more workable theory of intelligent design. It's absolutely not at all what Behe would want uh, taught in schools. And what Galen observed was that horses, for example, do not spontaneously form from ashes. This is his actual example. But they do develop slowly as fetuses following a particular causal sequence of growth. Now, which intelligent design theory best explains this fact? Behe's, the one Behe wants, or Galen's? Galen's explains this. Sometimes fetuses come out wrong, miscarriages and mutants. Sometimes bodies break down or malfunction, diseases and disorders. Which theory best explains this? The mere fact that bodies have to be designed in the first place also requires an explanation. Why do they need to be complex? In a modern analogy, if God can do anything, why not make us as simple homogenous soul bodies that realize our functions by direct act of will or expedient polymorphism? Why aren't we all Casper the ghost? Why do we need to be made out of complex cellular structures? Intelligent design doesn't really make any sense of this. Galen actually, I'm gonna argue, is a real creation scientist. Unlike Behe, or in fact any, any modern creationist, Galen's creationism led him to conduct extensive empirical research and experimentation greatly advancing scientific knowledge. Unlike Behe, Galen tested specific theories of his opponents and refuted them experimentally, or tried to anyway. Unlike Behe, Galen developed a specific theory of intelligent design that made particular predictions about what would and shouldn't be observed in plant and animal bodies, and what the me means and motives of the designer must be in light of available evidence. So for him, and for real creation scientists, or cre real creation scientists in general, theology is a scientific theory it therefore has to be adjusted according to the facts and limited to what it explains. So one has to infer things about God from the facts that are observed, rather than ignoring facts or forcing them to fit a preconceived theology. This is the difference between theology and science when you look at intelligent design as a theory. The facts entail either divine malice or limits to divine power or the non-existence of God. A scientist will explore these options and devise ways to test them. 
Evolution theory, as it happens, now well confirmed, actually limits viable theories of divinity even further than Galen was aware. Um, this is a fact that Behe generally ignores. And we know examples of this other way of doing it, like the, uh, Ken, this is from the Ken Ham's Creation Museum in Kentucky, uh, plate explaining the Grand Canyon as the product of uh, the Great Flood, where what they're doing is they're looking at the facts and trying to force those facts to, ex to fit their preconceived theory by just explaining away the facts and how they fit it. They're not actually testing their theory. They're not actually trying to find out if the theory is true or false. And this actually goes against the basic scientific values that we know Galen and other scientists of his time, cr even creation scientists of his time, advocated. Curiosity is a moral good. It's actually good for you to be curious about things. You should be asking questions about everything. That's awesome. That's a fundamental scientific value. Empiricism is the primary mode of discovery. It's the supreme authority, not scriptures, not holy men, not uh, religious authorities, empirical facts. That's your primary authority. And progress is both possible and valuable. Go make scientific progress, advance knowledge. These are the scientific values that ancient scientists believed in. Ancient creationists, not so much. So for, for Galen, science was pious because it discovered the causal mechanisms by which God realized his, his will and nature, um, discovering the powers and intentions of God and advancing human happiness and result. So understanding the universe was the highest worship for him. Doing science was the highest worship for him. For the early Christians of his own time, by the way, science was impious because, and these are the arguments they actually made, it exceeded what God saw fit to reveal. Progress in scientific knowledge was neither possible nor useful. Any plausible story was as good as any other. And the more attention you pay to the creation, the less you pay to the creator, and one must worship not but God. That was the view of the ancient Christians, which is why they weren't very big on science. Here's an example, Tertullian. What concern have I with the conceits of natural science? It were better for one's mind to ascend above the state of the world, not to stoop down to uncertain speculations. On brain science specifically, Tertullian, remember the stuff I mentioned about brain science earlier? This is what Tertullian says. It's better not to know what God has not revealed than to know it from man, because man is too presumptuous. Hence, for a Christian, only a few words are needed to have knowledge of any subject. For there is always certainty in those few words. Man is not allowed to investigate any further than what he is allowed to discover anyway. For the Apostle Paul forbids endless questions. Hence, man is not permitted to discover any more than what is learned from God. For that which is learned from God is all there is to know. Not a scientist, he. And there's a famous story about Thales, kind of the originator of science as we know it, uh, that he was so enthralled in watching the stars as he walked along that he stumbled and fell into a pit. Uh, and this was a pagan joke talking about, you know, oh gosh, you know, the, sci the, the, you know, the, the scientist not paying attention to where he was stepping because he was so interested in the science. But this is what Tertullian does with this story. He says, you know what, Thales' fall into that pit is a figurative picture of the philosophers, of those, I mean, who persist in applying their studies to a vain purpose since they indulge a stupid curiosity on natural objects which they ought rather have for their creator and governor. Again, no fan of science, he. And Lactantius said similar things. I won't go uh, reading all of the different examples, but Lactantius is famous not only for being the tutor of Constantine, who would be the first Christian emperor, good lord, uh, because Lactantius was a flat, was flat earther, actually, um, which is astonishing in antiquity because they had vast scientific evidence that the earth was a sphere. Lactantius said that there's no way that the earth could be round because that would mean there's upside down people on the other side of it and that's just ridiculous. That was his argument against uh, round earth. Now, in reality, um, and there are other uh, Christians who said similar things, only scriptural knowledge is worthwhile and so on. But in fact, if you follow this pattern, research ends, right? This is the end of science if you think like this. And I'll show you again Ken Ham's museum. Creation Museum in Kentucky, complete with dinosaurs to wow the kids. Uh, you get panels like this talking about human reason is evil, God's word is great. Um, other interesting panels about how questioning is bad. You should never question things, you never ask questions. Because uh, remember, that's what Satan did, right? And that's what caused the fall in the Garden of Eden. You should never question things. So, no support for curiosity here. Evolution, I find amusing here that they've displayed evolution as either a serpent, which, you know, displaying it as kind of like Satan there, um, or something else. There's something curious here that we have a blue flaccid something or other right next to a rock-hard throbbing straight something. 
And, you know, guess which one is God's word versus evolution? I find it particularly interesting that the evolution one is ribbed for her pleasure. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who designed that, but there's something going on there. It doesn't have to be that way, right? Galen's faith, Galen was a, was a believer. He was a theist. He was a pagan theist, but whatever. His faith did not condemn fundamental scientific values, but in fact encouraged them. Curiosity, empiricism, progressivism. Galen's creationism was genuinely science-based, though it could only remain so as long as the facts supported it. Galen said it is impious towards the creator to leave unexplained any great work of his providence. This is the exact opposite attitude of the Christians. So remember Lactantius. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to go through the science of why, how the ancients knew uh, the Earth was a sphere, but they uh, knew it from watching ships, um, for those of you who can figure that out. Uh, they knew it from the times, the clocking the times of lunar eclipses in different cities. Uh, they knew it from uh, observing the fact that certain stars can't be seen in certain latitudes and others can. Uh, they knew it from, well, just the fact that the shape of the Earth's shadow on lunar eclipses is always the same. That's kind of a giveaway, but uh, unless you think about it. They also had calculated the actual diameter of the Earth by using the sphericity of it, measuring its sphericity by measuring shadows from different cities. Uh, you do the basic math on this, and they were accurate to about 10%. Uh, they were pretty close to the actual size, the actual diameter of the sphericity of the Earth. They even used the sphericity of the Earth to determine the distance of the moon with a clever application of trigonometry. Um, they were, in fact, quite accurate. They actually nailed the distance of the moon within its minimum and maximum. That, by the way, is quite impressive. I have a whole lecture on all of these other scientific accomplishments they made. But the key thing is also when the Earth is a sphere, it's really hard to get from place to place or to plan how long it's going to take to get there or where things are if you don't have an accurate map that actually conforms to the sphericity of the planet that you're trying to dominate. Uh, so the Romans were quite happy with the fact that they'd figured out the Earth was a sphere so they could actually develop accurate maps. Uh, and this is what Ptolemy did in the early Roman Empire. Ptolemy actually invented latitude and longitude that we still use today. Although, you know, the British Empire, being as arrogant as they are, they moved the center line from Alexandria to Greenwich. Uh, but apart from that, uh, one change, uh, they're using the exact same system he invented. And there are a variety of reasons he invented it, but he developed it in order to use, uh, in order to map a spherical surface onto flat pieces of paper so you could have accurate maps. Um, many examples of this and reconstructions of it as well. So this is the science, it was well-known science at the time that Lactantius is saying it's ridiculous. So he, Lactantius was the Ken Ham of his time, uh, and whereas all the scientists are just wagging their heads like, what an idiot you are. So it's the same thing that's been going on for 2,000 years. We're in the same boat we were then. Now, I don't have time to go through it, but there's lists after lists of all the other sciences that the ancients achieved, uh, understood physical laws in, understood uh, basic scientific principles, all through empirical study of nature. They accomplished quite a lot. And some of it is quite amazing. You probably never imagined or heard that uh, they had discovered these things. Most of it was forgotten in the Middle Ages, had to be rediscovered later. They even had mechanization and automation in industry. I do a whole talk on ancient technology that talks about that as well. The most impressive, of course, is the analog computer. Uh, we found one of these, by the way. We had lots of literary descriptions, but no one believed that they could possibly be true. Um, but we found one. Uh, actually, it was, bare, it was it sunk in a ship in 88 BC. We know that because of the coins on the ship, date the ship. Uh, a Roman ship uh, had looted some Greek city that it had captured. But it sank off the island of Antikythera. Uh, it was recovered in the early 20th century, uh, the pieces of it. And they found this machine, this intricately designed machine. This is all rusted up from you know, 2,000 years under the sea. If you look really closely, you can see some of the accurate uh, dial mechanisms, um, some of the Greek lettering there, is because the instruction manual was written on this computer, by the way, as well. Uh, it had a lot of dials and readouts. It had a lot of intricate gear work. This is an example of a lot of the gears have been frozen together uh, by time and uh, rust. Uh, we've done x-rays of it. We've done uh, coaxial tomography of it, so we can actually determine a 3D map of what's inside this rust these rusted chunks. And using all of that information, we've built one. Uh, reconstructed it from the information we have. Uh, this is the most accurate reconstruction based in, uh, built out of the actual materials the original would have been uh, built out of. Uh, it actually, you would turn a dial and it worked 250 years in, into the future. So you had 250 years in which you could reconcile four calendars. So you could pick any day up to 250 years ahead of you, reconcile all four calendars, know what day it is. You would know uh, where in the zodiac every single one of the visible planets was. 
you would know uh, the position of the sun in the zodiac, where it rose uh, every morning. You would know uh, where the moon would be. You would know what phase the moon would be in. And you could do all of this by just turning one dial. The entire gear mechanism did all of the rest. And it did this, by the way, with geocentric uh, calculations. And yet it was accurate, so accurate, in fact, it was this accurate. Uh, I've shown typical versus maximum error out to 25 years, by the way. So prediction of planetary position after 25 years was if you hold your thumb up as far out, it was as accurate as the width of your thumb uh, 25 years in advance positioning the planet in the sky. That's pretty damn impressive, I have to say. Christians weren't building stuff like this. They thought this was vain. Um, that's just a tantalizing taste, by the way. I do a whole other talk on uh, these technologies and how awesome and amazing they are and what they did with them. Uh, I'm going to publish this stuff eventually. I've just signed contracts, yay, finally, uh, to get them produced. The first will come out will be science, ed science Education in the Early Roman Empire. The sequel will be The Scientist in the Early Roman Empire. It'll have all these facts and tons more and all the research behind it if you're interested in that. So keep your eye out for those books. They're coming, uh, hopefully by the end of this year or early next. So that's my talk about how ancient science debates illuminate modern creationist debates. Thank you.